it's an honor to be able to introduce these panelists to you. I'm going to introduce all of them at once and in order of speaking. So you'll find out when you're speaking based on, on that. Uh, and um, as you may guess, Suchi Surya is going to be our first speaker. She's an assistant professor of computer science, health policy, and statistics at John Hopkins University. And her research focuses on statistical machine learning uh, with an emphasis on precision healthcare. So she's looking at designing methodologies and data-driven tools for optimizing healthcare delivery, uh, whether that is such things as electronic surveillance for reducing preventable adverse events in inpatient settings, as well as trying to characterize the heterogeneity in individualized risk trajectories for complex chronic diseases. She's been at Hopkins since 2012, and she received her PhD from Stanford University. Um, her work has been uh, widely published and disseminated, and I also want to note that uh, she has uh, an NSF Computing Innovation Fellowship, as well as competitive awards from uh, Google Research and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Um, Cliff Young will be our second panelist, and he is a member of the Google Brain Team, um, whose mission is to develop the deep learning technologies and deploy them throughout Google with applications, of course, in search and maps and photos and translate. Um, before Google Brain, uh, Cliff worked at DE Shaw Research um, and then was at Bell Labs before that. So he's going to be able to focus on kind of the underlying hardware and architecture that makes many of these technologies possible. Then Brenna Argoff is an associate professor of electrical engineering and computer science, mechanical engineering, and physical medicine and rehabilitation at Northwestern University. And that's an awful lot of faculty meetings to go to. Um, I remember anyone with those, uh, all, the, all those connections. Um, she's the founder and director of an assistive and rehabilitation robotics laboratory there at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, which is the premier uh, hospital in the U.S. for this work. Um, she is also a 2016 recipient of an NSF Career Award and was named one of the 40 under 40 uh, by Crane's Chicago Business. And then our closer for today is Jeff Bingham, uh, who's an associate professor at CMU, as well as the Language Technologies Institute and the Human Computer Interaction Institute there in the School of Computer Science. And he's going to talk to us about ways of combining different forms of AI systems, and in particular, combining crowds with other forms of AI uh, to make uh, novel interactive systems with a particular emphasis on people with disabilities. Um, he's a recipient of the Sloan Fellowship. Um, he was in the MIT Tech Review 30 under 35, and he's also a recipient of an NSF Career Award. So, terrific set of folks. I do want to acknowledge that um, Shwedek Battelle and Maya Maderick of UW and USC, respectively, were the two CCC members that helped pull all this panel together, um, but they couldn't be here, which is why I'm doing double duty today, but thanks to them as well. So, Suchi, word to you. Thanks, Beth, for inviting me. And Tad, thanks for that amazing talk. It felt like I was living in the future. Um, how do I control this guy? There you go. So, there you go. I want to tell you a little bit about um, how, so what Beth tasked me was to talk a little bit about as more and more data are becoming available in healthcare, and healthcare in particular is exciting because there's a real opportunity to amplify human expertise, um, what are the kinds of challenges we're facing? What are some examples where there's, um, in the near term, where we might be able to really make a difference and add value? And I don't mean in the sense that, hey, let's replace doctors, because I work very closely with them, and I think we're very, very, very far away from that reality. In fact, I don't even think that's a good reality to be actively thinking about. And uh, so I, my, I'm going to talk to you about three very specific examples. And in these three very specific examples, I'll give you three specific ways in which we will amplify uh, human ability. And then finally, talk a little bit about sort of uh, numerous open challenges and you know, things we need to address in order to be able to succeed in doing that. So here's the first example. And so this, the challenge here is helping doctors make measurements that they currently cannot make. So Parkinson's is one of the, lar um, most, one of the most prevalent neurologic diseases. Um, in Parkinson's, the challenge is it's a chronic disease. Patients live with it. Um, the challenge with Parkinson's is managing the disease. And you manage the disease by basically appropriately titrating the right kinds of drugs. 
The challenge with this disease is that over the course of a day, and so uh, symptoms fluctuate widely over the course of a day. So, you know, in the morning versus the evening, the degree to which you experience these symptoms vary quite a bit. But also over time, as patients, uh, you know, depending on how their trajectory, whether they, you know, how quickly they deteriorate or whether their disease is stable, their symptoms fluctuate. So for a physician, one of the big challenges is, can I get a more granular and deep understanding for this patient? What is the day-to-day -day symptom fluctuation like? And right now, the only tools they have available to them are 30-minute manual tests they conduct by themselves. And these tests are called, the, it's called the UPDRS, or the uh, Parkinson's Disease Severity Score, that they basically conduct in person in the clinic when a patient visits. Uh, it's a sequence of questionnaires. They're asking them to do a few tasks and measuring visually what's going on, and based upon that, coming up with the score. And that's allowing them to assess the extent to which this disease has progressed and uh, using that to be able to titrate how much medication to give and what sort of schedule to use. Of course, this is very, very, very far from an incomplete view by which they should be treating this patient because, again, like I said, if symptoms fluctuate a lot, you want to be able to titrate the drug to be able to give, for instance, if the person is more symptomatic in the morning, give greater dose in the morning. And if they're less symptomatic in the evening, give a smaller dose in the evening. And this is really important because if you overdose, it has strong side effects. If you underdose, you, don't, you aren't able to treat the symptoms enough, right? And so right now, they're fundamentally bottlenecked. So here's an example of, this is joint work that we've done with University of Rochester and Apple. And here what we've done is basically three and a half years ago, uh, this work uh, was started with a group of neurologists looking at cell phones and using neurological, uh, using uh, motor-based tests to be able to ask uh, uh, patients with Parkinson's to be able to do a few things on their phone. So it's two and a half minutes. They take five different tests. What it does is produces a large amount of data around their voice. So Parkinson's is a uh, neurological disease that mostly affects your motor symptoms as a starting point. And so what this app is trying to do is asking them to perform a sequence of uh, tests that allows us to measure motor function. And so here we're measuring their voice level, the ability to walk, gait, posture, and you know, um, sociability. And combining these um, in order to be able to, so this is a first of a kind result where what we're showing is using these kinds of diverse data that are being collected in this two and a half minute tests on a phone. At the bottom, what I'm showing you is a patient for whom over a six month period, automatically the phones, and so this blue line is basically us using uh, developing machine learning techniques that allow us to use this diverse heterogeneous data to be able to come up with a symptom profile, severity profile over time, where low means the patient's doing well, high means the patient's doing poorly, and this blue, this is a person who's deteriorating mildly over time, and um, the red and green arrows show fluct uh, symptom fluctuations on a daily basis that was automatically assessed. And here what we're seeing is this patient is indeed pretty responsive to drugs. Some are not responsive to drugs, so you can see that basically every time they take a drug, before and after, before their symptomology or severity level is high and below, it's low. And so here's an example of a way in which, again, in Parkinson's, right now they have no way of at home making these kinds of measurements. And this is very, very early work, but really opening up this area to be able to make far more precise measurements at home that allow us to now use this data to drive, start um, uh, driving care on a daily basis. Here's the second example. So here, they have a lot of the measurements they need to make. It's all in the clinic. Of course, more measurements are always better, but even with the measurements they do make, they struggle to try to make care decisions, and here's why. The challenge with these uh, autoimmune diseases, and I'm giving you an example with an autoimmune disease called scleroderma, there's tremendous heterogeneity across individuals in the way the disease presents. And these are systemic disease. It affects multiple organ systems. The degree to which it affects any single organ system in a given individual varies a lot. And so for, a given, for a, an expert, a physician, who's sitting there for a given patient, when they see this individual, and here's an example. This is on the x-axis, 
time in years, and this is again a chronic disease. They're treating, you know, they're trying to manage uh, this disease and um, reduce disease exacerbation over time. Here I'm showing you a marker, and this is very realistically what they're doing. They're trying to figure out, you know, like from past visits, they see these black dots, and this is a particular marker value they're very closely tracking, and it tracks their lung function. Majority of these patients in disease die because of poor lung function. And they're trying to guess, is this person going to be okay? As in, are they going to be stable, or are they gonna rapidly decline? And the challenge here is, you know, if the kidneys decline, it could get their lung function to decline. So very, you know, so even though they have all of the markers, the challenge they have is they don't know how to forecast for a given person what their likely trajectory is going to be. So it's cutting through the heterogeneity in order to be able to figure out how to individualize. And in this example, what I'm giving you here to the right, if you look at it, is again using machine learning. And here for a given example patient, I'm showing you three particular organ system markers that they closely track. And here, using machine learning methodologies developed for this, uh, these types of noisy, messy data, being able to prognosticate for this given individual, what is their likely trajectory to be? And so here in this blue, I'm showing you blue and green, I'm showing you the most um, the highest and the next highest modes of the distribution, telling you what the likely trajectory is for this person. In red, I've superposed what actually happened in the future as we track this individual over time. So it gives you a sense for, for them, now you're helping them see, you know, for uh, taking, a, uh, taking like data from past patients that have come into their unit, being able to think about how to characterize these different types of heterogeneity and generalize from these past patients to this new patient. Third example, and here again, uh, here's a, a different one where instead of forecasting, the goal is to do detection. And this is an example where in the hospital, tons and tons of data being collected, and in this particular example, I'm talking about uh, potentially preventable conditions. So uh, one that we worked on a lot is called this potentially preventable condition called sepsis. It's the 11th leading cause of death, and sepsis is preventable if you treat it early enough. The challenge is recognizing it early enough. And here, what I'm showing you is, um, if, and doctors have trouble recognizing sepsis early enough, because the signs and symptoms are too subtle. And so here I'm showing you a third example where basically using um, technologies, machine learning technologies to be able to take these hundreds of high dimensional time series, and here you're looking at very noisy, like in this picture itself, like some measurements are taken once a day, others are taken 200 times a day, some measurements are taken only upon the discretion of the uh, doctor, versus others may be taken uh, regularly. Um, and some are recorded by machines, others are recorded by humans. So effectively, from a machine learning standpoint, this is a very challenging problem area. And what we're trying to do is take these numerous unreliable measurement noisy sources and trying to identify what are these early signs and symptoms that are indicative of decline due to infection and sepsis. And, what, and in this example, so for instance, one result we've shown is that it's possible to identify patients much earlier than current standard of care. Not only that, by basically carefully reasoning through the uncertainty and modeling noise around individual measurements, you can reduce the degree of false alerting by a great deal. And so in all three examples, I gave you areas where, you know, we can fundamentally expand physician expertise by using machine learning and modern computing technologies to either um, make new measurements, uh, cut through heterogeneity, or um, you know, catch subtle signs and symptoms that human eye cannot easily catch. And in order for this to actually become something that is realizable, there's a, in practice, or to be translated in practice, there's still a lot of fundamental things that need to be solved. So, you know, it's all the way from the very basics of the fact that every hospital EMR is slightly different. And so this means rather than trying to impose a standard, a given standard that every hospital has to collect data in, using, you know, data wrangling technologies to be able to homogenize data. Two, to be able to do the kinds of techniques I spoke about, it's very compute intensive and we need fl flexible, scalable inference algorithms that are reliable. And by reliable, I mean robust to noise, robust to different kinds of biases that exist in these environments. Third, and most
most uh, open is the, the fact that even if we present these inferences to the user, how do we make it so that we build a system that is allowing us for the humans to be maximally productive with the uh, machine outputs itself? And then other example areas like how do we communicate when to trust and when not to trust the models? Or how do we understand and estimate what are the different types of noise sources so we can tell them when it could be noisy data and therefore they shouldn't trust it versus um, you know, when there is noise because we don't have enough support in the model to trust the inferences. And with that, thank you. I'm from Google, uh, which is, uh, gives me a particularly industrial perspective for this audience. And I was hoping to combine a couple of different themes in this talk, one of which is what is the computing infrastructure that backs this AI revolution that we're working on at Google today? And also, as a second theme, to interweave with that, what's the interplay between what I think of as research and what you can see in Google's very commercial developments? Because I think um, at Google, perhaps more than many other places on the planet or in the history of mankind, we've interwoven research and development in virtuous ways and that tie back to the academic and governmental as well as industrial themes in this, con uh, in this conference. So first of all, who's this guy on stage? Uh, I'm Cliff. I like to think of myself as both a researcher and an engineer. I like building new things. And so in part, the novelty, the where no one has gone before aspect gets me out of bed in the morning and I've I've been privileged in my career to build a number of different, it turns out, special purpose computers. And I'll come back to that during the course of the talk. Um, but I come from this community. I, I got a PhD at Harvard in 1998, backed by an Office of Naval Res uh, Research Fellowship. My advisor, Mike Smith, had a Presidential Young Investigator Fellowship, which was key to launching his career as a professor. I've also, and maybe the slide bullets are a little too small, experienced a number of different flavors of industrial research over the course of my career. And so right out of grad school, I went to Bell Labs and got to enjoy maybe the last few years of that great uh, regulated monopoly, in some ways publicly funded omnibus research lab, which I think the 20th century benefited hugely from in all of the innovations you've heard about Bell Labs having created, and whose like we have not yet seen again. And then I spent 10 years at a place called D.E. Shaw Research, which ideally nobody has, has heard of. I shouldn't say ideally. It's, it's a, um, a very focused research lab. David Shaw is perhaps most famous for being a hedge fund billionaire, but he spent the last 15 years of his career attempting to cure cancer using structure-based drug design me mechanisms, using computers that are supercomputer scale, because he's had a lot of wonderful success in his career with computational methods. And in many ways, biology and chemistry have to be the next thing to fall. That these gigantic complexes of wet labs ought to be supplemented by, by simulation at some point in our progress in computers, and the question is just when. So in those 10 years at D.E. Shaw Research, I built uh, so-called Anton machines, which are molecular dynamics supercomputers. They are special purpose machines that turn out to be a thousand times faster than their national lab's supercomputing class counterparts. So, so this is not a thousand times faster than, than Thad's glass device or even my laptop. This is a thousand times faster than Oak Ridge National Lab's supercomputing clusters uh, in a box that's essentially four racks. And so there's really high potential in a new wave of special purpose computer architecture and computer systems, hardware and software that are rolled out based on a base layer of incredibly specialized hardware and then the whole system that, uh, that makes that possible. And I should say that, in some ways, because D.E. Shaw Research is privately funded, that was an experience of what you might call Renaissance Salon research, that David was an enlightened individual who was individually capable of financing research at <coughs> industrial scale in a way that you know, most of us probably can't. Uh, that was also a really great vision of how enlightened individuals can make a huge difference in modern society. We're getting a bunch of that kind of enlightened investment in research and society today. I think it's one great possible avenue for it, but I don't think it should be the only one that our society chooses to invest in. And for the last four and a half years, I've been at Google, uh, which you perhaps heard of. And I think at its best, Google fuses the best of Silicon Valley development with the best of academic research. 
that one of the things that's unique about Google is that we very rarely have separated research groups from development groups. We take people with PhD backgrounds, or in fact professors at the very top of their fields, and we embed isn't quite the same, quite the right term. We, we uh, synergistically build them into groups with developers who can build hardware and software systems and launch actual products at Google scale. Um, I haven't seen that mix elsewhere. That is different from the Bell Labs Industrial Research Lab scale, which was focused on research primarily and less on getting products out that helped the, film, uh, the phone system. Google, of course, is building real products and delivering them, and those products have impact on our real lives, uh, as I think the next slide talks about. So Google has this very modest mission of organizing the world's information and making it universally accessible and useful. And we saw it start 20 years ago with just search and just on the web, and the web was this beautifully digitally accessible thing in that time frame. And I'm at least old enough to remember life before search and going through card catalogs and huh. reading, reading the references section of my papers and then having to go fetch the paper from the library and so forth, and what an incredibly awful process that was. And nowadays, of course, I just click to things and the references just link to archive and I'm at the forefront of human knowledge in seconds. Uh, search and the web as a whole have changed humans have, in the, in the theme of this panel, augmented what we take for granted, what we're capable of thinking or remembering or accessing in ways that are uh, less cool than the, the monitoring devices, but that are nonetheless every day. We, we take this for granted as much as the, the air we breathe. So maybe that's one form of human augmentation. And I think we've, we started on the desktop with search and we have, we've branched out from there. We have new devices that you know, go on your kitchen countertop and, and my phone now I can say, okay, Google to and ask it things. And uh, that's surprisingly better over the course of the last four years. It actually works in my car these days with all the background noise and my kids uh, yelling. Uh, I think the speech thing is real. I think we're making vocal interfaces work. I think it's early days yet that the, the clarity of say the Mac GUI where you sit down at it and it's like, wow, this is how I want to use a computer. I haven't quite had that moment with my Google Assistant on the phone or Google Home, but it's, it's getting there. And the set of things that are enabled by these vocal interfaces, you know, I, I set kitchen timers and I ask what the weather is and so forth, but I, I can feel what the next level beyond that is and I think it'll be here very, very soon. So, let's see. So to maybe pull back the Google curtain a little bit, where you see us most is in the affordances that you work with. So you see us in your desktop machine, in your laptop machine, and on your phone, and in your translation earbuds, if you bought those products, please do. Uh, but there's actually a federation to Google's products and services, that we have all these so-called edge devices, which are near people, that how, allow people to do their interactions, and then we have things called data centers that are off, mostly far away from major uh, population centers, that are in some ways the factories of the modern information age. They are huge, centralized, warehouse scale computing devices, they're maybe the first forays that Google have made, has made into special purpose uh, computing infrastructure. That we sort of started with what you might think of as the web, as there's a server somewhere out there, and it's just, just a single server. Actually, that was never true of Google. Like, it was never the case that there was one box that was answering your queries. It was always a collection of boxes flying in very close formation that would answer a Google search query. But those boxes live in these gigantic buildings uh, that are, are literally warehouse size. And I think I have some cool pictures. Let's see. Oh, oh, let me skip to the cool pictures and come back. So this is a satellite view from Google Maps of one of our data centers, and these little tiny dots here are cars. Uh, so it, this is literally a warehouse-sized computer. You can imagine you take a car, replace it with two racks worth of computing, tile that over the area you can see in this, and possibly do multiple stories of that. You rapidly get to buildings that consume tens of megawatts worth of power, and this is just one of them, and they're, they're you know, there's more than one of them, I should perhaps say. From the inside, they might look like this. And once again, this is sort of the warehouse scale computing. This one actually looks underfilled to me because there's all that airspace over the, the racks. But from I, friends who have visited these have described them as being akin to that final scene in Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark where there's just a warehouse full of boxes. If you imagine turning each of those wooden boxes into a computer, and then imagine running hundreds of watts to each one of those boxes and then cooling those boxes and so forth. That's, that's sort of the scale at which, at which we operate these days to do these interfaces. So search queries and speech queries and translation and you know one of those racks runs AlphaGo 
and, uh, and so forth, all go back to data centers in various locations around the world uh, to, to respond to the things that you expect out of Google Daily. Let me back up a little bit. Oh no, can I not back up? There we go. I think other people have mentioned that deep learning has at least two kinds of scale required to make it possible. One is in the big data dimension, that we now house data sets in our data centers on the fleet of spinning disks that we have that, that are kind of ludicrous in size, right? Just the, the web itself is a billion pages. Google Street View, if you imagine 40 million miles of road on the planet and we take a picture every 50 feet uh, and then index them all is a rather large data set. And YouTube gets, what, 300 hours uploaded per minute? So that's what factor times real time? I'd have to do math. It's you know, 20,000 times real time uploads compared to actual time passing. There's also this gigantic explosion in compute that the neural network revolution kind of took off about five years ago where the right training set came together with a GPU, which NVIDIA bills as the supercomputer under your desk. And, and I believe a bunch of that. This was the densest instantiation of that sort of power form factor of computing up until that point. And maybe one of the dings on the deep learning branch of AI and possibly for AI for a large fraction of the last 30 years is that things didn't necessarily work and the proponents of these techniques would say, if only I had another factor of two computing, it's gonna be great. It turned out that if you go back in time and ask Jeffrey Hinton in maybe the 80s about when's back propagation really going to take off, he might have said, I only need a factor of two computing, you know, the next Moore's Law step in two years will get me there. And he was only off by a factor of about a million or so. So if you have a million times the data and a million times the compute, you can make these machine learning techniques work. And that's, that's kind of a phase change. It's, you can't tell from before the phase change when you get the million times more compute and data what is the thing that's gonna work? What is the thing that might be transformative? But somehow we crossed a threshold five years ago and suddenly first image recognition and then speech and then a whole bunch of other application areas suddenly became transformed by this deep learning technique where throwing what turns out to be special purpose matrix multiplication calculations at a pile of data turns into gold, turns into my computer can understand me and translate for me and find better web pages and play Go and so forth. Okay, so pictures of data centers. So part of where I come into this is that Google is now building its own chips for the first time in its history. We started roughly four years ago when I, when I joined. We have a couple of generations of so-called tensor processing units or TPUs out. I'm, I'm sorry, I only have cold media, like static pictures of the things. The worst thing about being a hardware person is the demos suck. It's kind of like, hi, I got a car, isn't it great? Um, although I, I suppose the, you know, maybe the rejoinder to that is that the end-to-end -end system, the demo's already in your pocket if you just like, go ask to get something translated or use word lens or something like that. The deep learning problem has kind of two pieces to it. One is called inference or serving. It's kind of once you've got your deep learning model built, then you use it to recognize speech or to play AlphaGo or whatnot. There's a second problem, training. I'll come back to it in a second, uh, in just a moment. But the first generation TPU is a serving only device. It was built as a crash program inside of Google because we saw deep learning taking off internally. We saw the results we were getting in speech and photo processing and said, we'd better scramble because if everybody on the planet talks to their cell phone for a minute a day, we will need to double the size of the fleet. All those buildings will need to buy twice as many of them. And all the gigawatts of power, we would need to double that too. And that is not a great option to be, to, to be facing. So instead, we built these things. And it turns out that we, we run all of these applications on them. So the motivation for that is avoid or handle the success disaster in terms of Google's infrastructure. Give ourselves another option. That's just the, if you've already trained the model, which happens today on GPUs, what about how do you create this machine learning model? How do you get it to teach itself to translate or to play, alpha, uh, to play Go? And the second generation TPU, which this isn't actually showing the chip, this is a board with four chips on it, uh, we announced about six months ago at Google I.O. and is a combined training and inference device which we are using internally for uh, our research purposes. But we're also, breaking with some of Google tradition, and instead of just keeping it as a proprietary internal technology, we're going to make it available through Google Cloud. And so these will be available for, for industry to rent. And beyond that, we're making a thousand of these devices available for free for academics to use. Uh, and I, I think there's, a, there's some things you have to say that you're going to make your research open sourced. But our belief is that the deep learning revolution is wide, 
is you know, this amazing moment in science right now where there's actually not enough compute out there. Like, I, I talk to many of my professor friends and they have like 10 GPUs and, and we have an internal Google phrase of like, I can't count that low. But in some ways, the, 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 the gap between what we see inside of Google as far as resources and what uh, a typical university research group enjoys through generous funding is, is a big gap. And we would like to address that. And so the, the TensorFlow Research Cloud is an attempt to address that, to make sure that we can unlock a bunch of this hardware and people-enabled uh, research by putting them together. So let's see. So I, let me skip over the, the slide I just skipped over and just wrap up by pulling the threads back together. So I feel like industry, academia, and government have very complementary roles. Uh, at, even at Google, there's a whole bunch of six-month development time frame work that goes on. There are a few groups at Google that get to do forward-looking research in the five years out sort of time frame. Uh, but we are a business. We've got to make money. We have to build products that people actually use. And so only a small fraction of the company can actually look very far forward. I think academia can and should be looking much farther out. And I think the trade-off associated with that is that it's risky, right? Development isn't risky. You know, you know, it's, here's the product. We know we're going to build it. If we build it, then people will use it, and that'll be great. But research has the, the chance that it won't necessarily pan out, and that's intrinsic to the, to the process. Um, to go back to the, the roots of deep learning, Jeff Hinton and Jan LeCun and so forth and other researchers in, in this field, I think spent effectively decades in the wilderness with people not believing that their stuff was going to work. And in fact, their stuff didn't work for those decades until about five years ago. One of the things that I can't do is I can't tell today's Jeff Hinton or Jan LeCun from, from any of the other things that because of the nature of research wouldn't necessarily pan out. And what that means is if you're saying, well, let's evaluate, let's, let's take our time machine back 30 years and say, should we fund this research on these professors who think that they can represent how the human brain works by doing matrix multiplications in computer hardware? And by the way, nobody can do matrix multiplications because they're too expensive computationally. That might look like a bad bet. Um, I don't think you should say, oh, right now it looks like a bad bet is a, bad, is a reason not to fund research. I think instead, government might be in the business of portfolio management. That there are a number of great people with innovative and transformative ideas, and we can't tell ahead of time which way technology and society and innovations of various sorts are going to fit together. So rather than trying to pick the winners ahead of time, which sounds awfully Soviet to me, by the way, why don't we make a broad set of investments? Why don't we go large numbers of high risk, high reward, and seed the Jan LeCun's and Jeffrey Hinton's and Yasha Bengio's of today, so that 20 years from now, when the next revolution is about to start, it's ready. Uh, so anyway, I, I think there's, there's a bunch of beauty in the, the complementary roles that we each have a part to play, that academia creates the people that I, I hire as colleagues, and you know, we write papers with academia, so I, I guess Google Brain is actually contributing to this academic discourse that is happening right now, and the academic groups also contribute fundamental research, and that dialogue is incredibly enabling and is allowing us to build this next generation of super cool products and services. So I think that's it for me. Thanks. And um, I'm going to start out talking a little bit about the field of human rehabilitation. So as was mentioned, as Beth mentioned, that my lab is actually inside of a rehabilitation hospital, um, what was formerly the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago and is now called the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab. Within the field of rehabilitation, our first line of defense is rehabilitation and physical therapy. We want to rehabilitate the human body as far as we can to have it regain as much function as it can, if not all function. However, there are times when rehabilitation reaches a plateau and we are left with a functional gap. And in that case, we often fill the gap with assistive machines or assistive devices that are not powered. So by far the mo most ubiquitous is the powered wheelchair. We th see things like prosthetic limbs. We're starting to see robotic arms that are mounted to powered wheelchairs. 
and um, things like exoskeletons we hope are, one day will be used as mobility devices. Now, these machines are all designed to be 100% controlled by humans. And there is an issue as people become more and more motor impaired that the interfaces which available, are available to them are more and more information poor, and they are, it is a struggle to operate these machines with those kind of interfaces often. So if we start with um, the powered wheelchair as an example, this traditionally is operated with a two-axis joystick. So if you're able to operate a joystick with your hand or with some other part of your body, um, you basically get a two-dimensional continuous valued control signal, and this fully covers the control space of the powered wheelchair. So for a wheelchair, you need to specify speed and you need to specify heading. Um, if someone is not able to operate a joystick like this, then the commercial interfaces which are available to them instead become one-dimensional, so not, it can't cover the whole control space anymore. <clears throat> Um, and it's discrete. So unlike with the joystick where you deflect it further and you go faster, these are just operating with a flat control signal amount. And if you want to actually change how fast you're going, you actually have to go back and navigate back to a menu and choose a different power level. So um, on the bottom there, you see two interfaces that are used most broadly commercially. Um, the left are actually switches, which are embedded within the headrest. And on the right is a sip and puff, which looks like a straw-based interface, and you actually operate it through, exhalation, res through respiration, inhalation and exhalation. Here's an example of what it looks like to operate a powered wheelchair with each of these devices. So what you might notice is that on the left, using a joystick, that this is sort of a smoother operation, whereas on the right, using this switch-based head array, um, it's more discreet and kind of a choppier, uh, choppier control signal and control. Um, but what you might also notice is that this is still a difficult task. So even with the joystick, this is a difficult task. And I should mention that the, the person who's operating this wheelchair, he does have a high spinal cord injury, but he's also been driving a powered wheelchair for 25 years. Sorry, I'm losing my breath a little. <laughs> um, he's, uh, he, now, he's not necessarily used to driving our powered wheelchair, but he is an expert at driving his own powered wheelchair. And that is because this is a spatially constrained task, and even with a meeting ADA specifications, you only have about five centimeters on each side of wiggle room to actually get through this, this doorway. Now, I just talked about powered wheelchairs, which are only a two-dimensional control problem. As we move into more sophisticated um, assistive machines, they oftentimes require a higher dimensional control signal. So just to specify the position and orientation of a robotic hand, uh, at the end of an arm. So this isn't even to operate the hand or the gripper. This is just to position it. That's a six-dimensional signal that you need. So you need 3D position and 3D orientation. So now to even cover that with a powered or with a joystick is something that only covers a portion of the control space. So what you end up doing is partitioning the control space and maybe you can operate just in this plane and then you have to push a button and then you can operate in orientation. You push a button to do something else. So the more limited your interfaces then, the more control modes you have to have. And in practice, to operate a robotic arm like this using the interfaces that are just to the right of it, these limited control interfaces that are accessible to people with tetraplegia, for example, um, it just doesn't happen. And so we're left with this confound where the more motor impaired someone is, actually the less able they are often, often the less able they are to actually operate the power or the assistive machines that were designed to help them. And this um, oh, and here's a video that I can show you about what it looks like to operate one of these assistive robotic arms using a joystick. So what you'll notice right here is that he's pushing a button. This is to switch between control modes. He actually doesn't have the finger function to push the button, so he has a, a, utility cuff, a utility cuff with a pen inside of it that he's using to push buttons. This is just within my lab for the study. Um, and then you'll notice that he pushes it, and then he starts to operate, and he realized actually that wasn't the control mode he wanted to be in. So he used to push it again and s select the correct control mode. And this is what operation looks like. And this is using the joystick. This is not using these more limited control interfaces that would be available if his paralysis was more severe. So this, op this, offers, oops, sorry. this offers an opportunity for robotics autonomy that by introducing robotics autonomy to assistive machines, we can offload some of the control burden from the human to the machine. Now, these are not 100% autonomous systems. We know that is not the solution that these end users actually want. This is a shared control system 
where you have um, a control signal coming from the autonomy and also coming from the human. And now a big research question is, what do we do with these two control signals? How do we integrate this in a way where we are not over-assisting, we're never taking control away from the end user when they don't want us to, because then we're actually making them less able, and that's the opposite of what we're trying to do. And also, how do we still, though, provide safety and assistance? Um, so really, the devil is in the detail in how we introduce this um, AI and this autonomy to these machines. So this is the big, this is the big question. So as just sort of a quick illustrative example, if we have sort of here a mock-up where we, um, the, the image on the bottom is sort of the footprint of the powered wheelchair and we've got the human giving the red arrow control signal and the autonomy giving the blue arrow control signal, we need to somehow reason about what to do with these two signals. And I could tell you that within the literature, a lot of different ways have been proposed. What we haven't seen though is really much comparison of these different um, of these different ways to control the robot. And I think that one of the reasons why is this. So that we've implemented these four on our wheelchair platform in my lab, and what you, you might notice is that actually just by observing it, they don't look that different. And when you evaluate them according to the metrics that we typically use to evaluate robotics autonomy, things like task completion time, um, number of collisions, uh, distance to obstacles, things like that, they all perform approximately similarly. But the thing is, is that they feel different to the end user, and people have a difference in preference um, over them. So here is a distribution of which of these sort of five control interfaces, so, or control paradigms, so it was the four I showed there, plus a, um, a scenario where there was no assistance. And if we had consensus amongst our research subjects that said this one is the best, this is the way to do it, we would only see one color on this plot. And clearly we see a distribution. What's more is that this distribution changes with the type of control interface that someone is using about 50% of the time. So it means that when people, when the information that someone is able to give to the machine changes, either in the difficulty or the information content, that also their preference in how they want to be assisted changes. One more example from my lab um, is that we looked at actually in allowing the end user to actually customize how this control sharing is happening. So on the top, this is the unassisted, um, the unassisted uh, execution, which I showed you earlier. And on the bottom, we had an exploratory study where we allowed people to sort of customize by saying, I wish the autonomy had helped me out earlier, or I wish it had helped me out faster, things like that. And then we could change the function that was actually dictating how control was shared between the two, and then have them operate with that. And you can see in the lower right here, this is um, this user now operating with a function that they customized themselves. They didn't necessarily know the details of that it was a function and that they were actually changing parameterizations of the function. But you can see it's much smoother. He actually never needs to do a mode switch, which is, there's other reasons for that as well that I'd be happy to talk about later. Um, but we see that when, when they've been able to customize their own function, that they perform better. And we see this in the, um, in the, the quantitative data as well. Uh, one of the most interesting things, in my opinion, that came out of this study was the fact that we saw statistically significant differences between our subject groups that had a spinal cord injury and that didn't have a spinal cord injury when they were operating without assistance, when they were operating with a minimum amount of assistance and a maximum amount of assistance. When they were operating with their customized amount of assistance, it actually lay somewhere between minimum and maximum. And yet, it was that somewhere in between, which was the only one that was able to get rid of this statistically significant difference. If you had asked me, I would have thought it was the maximum amount of assistance, because that's where the autonomy was playing the biggest role, and the autonomy is the only thing that's the same across all people. Um, but that wasn't the case, which tells us that people have some sort of an insight in how they are interacting with this autonomy that we at least can't capture yet. So just very briefly, I should say, since I showed a little bit of data from my lab, I want to acknowledge, of course, the students and postdocs that actually gathered that data and did that work, and also the funding agencies that supported it. Um, and then just to sort of conclude and recap, when we think about advancing human autonomy with robotics autonomy, with artificial intelligence, um, these are sort of some of the take-home points, at least from my domain. So first is that robotics autonomy can for sure be used to bridge gaps in human function. However, we are definitely seeing 
um, preliminary evidence that says this autonomy should be customized to the human. And the reason why is that if we customize to the lowest baseline, to the amount of assistance that will provide help to everyone who could possibly need help, the people who have more ability across that spectrum will be sort of impaired. They'll be capped and they won't be able to contribute as much to the execution and that's not what we should be doing to these end users. We should be customizing and giving them the right amount of assistance. Another thing that I didn't really talk about is that how we do this customization, it likely needs to adapt over time. And the reason why is because the human is, is changing over time. So this might be because they are physically changing, because they're in rehabilitation and they're regaining ability. Or it might be that they have a degenerative disease and they're losing ability. It also might be that factors that just fluctuate throughout the day or week to week, like pain and fatigue, that those actually influence how much assistance we should be providing as well. And what this looks like from a machine learning standpoint, where you now have these super sparse, noisy signals that are coming from people with motor impairments, that hasn't really been addressed yet. And the fourth point I'd like to make is that this actually extends to other human robot teams as well. So I've talked about a very specific human robot team, where this is a shared control system of an assisted machine that was traditionally human operated and now we've introduced autonomy, but there are lots of domains, whether it be extreme environments like space where we have human robot teams to uh, what we might think of as more traditional environments like the factory floor where we're gonna now have human robot teams instead of just robots behind cages. Um, and even scenarios that we can't really imagine yet where we have devices that we've traditionally operated like cars, for example. Um, that are now going to be a shared human-robot team, and that these principles, I believe, will show up in all of those areas. Thank you. All right, hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Bigham from uh, Carnegie Mellon University. So artificial intelligence has this great potential to amplify and augment all of our abilities. And this is especially true for people with disabilities where AI can start to provide better access to the world. People with disabilities have been among the earliest adopters of AI and as such, there's a lot that I think we can learn from how they interact with intelligent technology. And so um, what I'd like to uh, talk about today is um, the case of visual assistance for a blind person, for blind people. Um, and if you think about it, uh, visual assistance for blind people should really be a grand challenge for computer vision. So this is the area of computer science that attempts to ca allow computers to visually perceive um, the world as the human eye can do. And thus, what can be, uh, what should be more core than allowing a blind person to perceive um, the world as a sighted person could. And so there's been a lot of um, history, actually, at the intersection of computer vision and accessibility. But often, I feel like it's been at this kind of an afterthought where uh, people develop really cool computer vision technology, um, and then they say, hey, I wonder if a blind person could use that, and they try to adapt that. And so, so what we've done with my group a few years ago is we developed a relatively simple uh, application for mobile phones called VizWiz that allowed a blind user to take a picture speak a question they'd like to know about that picture, and then get answers back. Um, and the way we made the answers reliable enough to be used in the real world was to have this be crowdsourced. So we recruited people from the web to answer the questions. Um, and we were able to do this pretty quickly. So in about 30 seconds, people are able to get um, an answer back. Um, we deployed this. We had about um, 10,000 people use it, um, over 100,000 questions asked. And there's this huge wide range of questions that were asked, which is really interesting and illuminating about what people really wanted to know. Um, so everything from, you know, what does this thermostat say? Um, to, you know, what is this product? Um, you might wonder, how do you tell what this, or how do I cook this? Uh, you might wonder, how can you answer that question from that photo? But it turns out a human can do it, right? It's all, it's the wrong orientation and the instructions are really small and blurry, but a human can do that. Um, what does the sky look like? So uh, the same user asked this question every five minutes over an hour, and we were wondering what in the world is going on. Um, but it turned out uh, he was watching the sunset. So it went from light to dark. Um, uh, 
Uh, to credit card information there, which we highly discourage and told people not to do, but they still did. Um, to, um, you know, what is this appliance? Uh, how do I use this appliance? Tell me about all the buttons, which actually this mode of, of interaction didn't really work so well to support. Um, I'll get back to that. Oh. Or um, fashion-related questions. So as opposed to just wanting to know what color something is, um, wanting to know a more contextual question, right? So does my clothing match? Does it go well together? Does it look good? Um, which is really hard, hard to answer um, automatically. And so we took this data, and for those, who, those participants who allowed us to do so, um, we collected that information, we removed as much um, person identifying information as possible, and um, released a data set of about 50,000 images, questions, and answers. And our hope is that this data set, you know, of real questions by actual users out in the world, um, may inspire computer vision researchers to work on this problem, um, maybe forming a really true grand challenge for their field. Um, and it's interesting, just as an aside, you know, when I first started working in this area, uh, computer vision uh, researchers that I would talk to would say, wow, that's a really interesting data set, um, but it's super hard. There's no way we could ever even hope to work on it, right? Um, but fortunately, as has already been mentioned, many fields, including computer vision, have advanced a lot just in the last few years. And so while this data set is still really hard, and we're very far from being able to answer many, if not most, of the questions automatically, um, with deep learning has, call, has come deep confidence. Um, <laughs> and I'll take that, because this is a really important problem, a really interesting one. Um, and so there's already a lot of people who have started to use our data set for various purposes. Um, one that I'll mention is uh, Microsoft, who has put out a product called uh, Seeing AI, which um, provides visual uh, or descriptions to visual images for blind people. And so you can check that out. And that was built partially um, trained on our uh, data set. So one thing that we noticed um, is that uh, there were a lot of questions that we could not very well support with this sort of interaction. And one of those was appliances. So we got a lot of pictures of microwaves, vending machines, printers, and other devices um, that just weren't designed for blind people to be able to use. Um, and it's difficult to describe the layout of a complicated device in a way that a person can understand. And it's nearly impossible um, to find the correct button that you're looking for if the interface is completely flat, as a lot of the devices that we have now are. And so what we did was kind of slightly modify the uh, VizWiz uh, workflow um, so that we could create a different system we called VizLens, very creative with our names, um, that enables blind people to use appliances. And so this is where we're going to start seeing crowdsourcing combined with computer vision combined with the user's abilities. Um, so the way this works is that users take a picture of the interface they want to use, crowd workers label it, and then computer vision running on the phone is able to tell them what button their finger is over. Um, I'm going to play a short video that describes this and show some examples. Oh, well, it's on my computer. Well, uh, I don't know if that'll work if I play it again or not. No. It's probably fine for this. You can try that. Yeah. All right. Let's see if I'll see how well that works. Business users capture a photo of the inaccessible interface and send it to multiple pro workers who work in parallel to quickly label and describe elements of the interface. The business application helps users recapture the interface in the field of the camera and uses computer vision to interactively describe the part of the interface beneath their finger. All right, so um, in this case, the computer vision works pretty well because we're not trying to solve the general problem of recognizing any interface, but rather recognizing the same interface from the same camera from roughly the same perspective and roughly the same lighting conditions. And we're able to do that because we've used crowdsourcing to generate this model uh, on the fly. And because we're doing that, and because it works um, pretty robustly across different interfaces, we can use it, uh, users can use it to control all kinds of different things. So here's some examples.
So I love ending on this example of the, um, of the laser cutter because it's all, why shouldn't a blind person be able to use a laser cutter? This is great. If they had glass, they could get that kind of feedback as well. That'd be great, right? Um, <laughs> so <laughs> in an extension, then we, we modified the workflow a bit where we had the user put a dollar bill next to the interface that they were trying to capture. And this serves two purposes. One is it provides this, this uh, fiduciary marker of a known size, which allows us to not just know where the buttons are, but what size they are. Um, and it also allows us to give them uh, feedback on how to aim the camera. And so I'll play this again. It has some audio, which I think will work now. She learns she has to go back a little farther than just once it recognizes the dollar. That's the interface in there too. All right. Um, and because now we know the size of the buttons, we can automatically produce a um, a 3D model for a tactile overlay that we're then uh, going to have printed, 3D printed. And either this could be on a home printer if people have a, a high quality home 3D printer, um, or sent off to a 3D printing service, which can um, deliver these in a, a couple of days to your home. And then independently attached back on the interface to make it accessible um, just with an adhesive. All right, so by releasing this general crowd-powered system, we're able to motivate a number of lines of research, both computer vision on hard, the hard general problem of answering arbitrary visual questions, and also research into systems that combine the user, crowds, and computer vision to kind of amplify all of their abilities, use all their abilities together um, for specific tasks. Uh, and so this experience has led to some generalizable thoughts, I think, for AI systems. And you know, I, I really like that Brenna's talk became before mine um, because I think the example that she gave was a great example of people with disabilities being the early adopters, the ones that kind of show us the way, you know, how will we want to collaborate with autonomous systems, right? And so maybe it's now wheelchairs, but um, in, the in the near future, that's, that's the self-driving or partially self-driving cars. Um, so working with AI, so uh, early on in the project, Justin Romack, who's an independent um, blind blogger, uh, recorded a video about how to use VizWiz, and in his demonstration, he illustrates some of the themes that I think um, we extracted from this experience. So here's Justin asking his question. I've got my thermostat here, and I've set it way down, and I'm gonna take a picture here. So uh, place this, move it back a little bit. Take a picture, and I'm going to record my question. What does this thermostat say? All right, so um, one thing that we noticed pretty quickly is that it's actually pretty difficult for blind people to take pictures, but a good picture is vital for either a human-powered or a machine-powered uh, computer vision system to work well. Picture here. So you might have seen kind of how he did this. Move it back. Put the phone up, moved it back. Um, and it, as a result, um, both uh, we and others have worked a lot on what we call blind photography. And so the lesson here is that while it still will be a while before AI can take over many of the tasks we want to do with computer vision fully, once we understand the components of the interaction, AI can be incredibly useful in supporting the human-machine collaboration, in this case, helping people take a better photo. All right. Um, and let's see, let's see him get an answer back. Let's see, it already has some answers available. The IQ engines has it labeled as a thermostat, so we knew that, that doesn't do me too much good. So that, that answer came back from a service that just identifies the main object in a photo. And of course, Justin knew this was a thermostat, right? And so while it may be obvious, one lesson is to work toward providing information that people actually want to know. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of effort has been put into, for example, providing fairly generic labels for images. For instance, Facebook has started tagging all of the images um, with such labels, and this is great. Um, but I think we need to not pretend that this is likely to answer all questions or even a lot of them. 
people, uh, blind people included, have access to all kinds of other information, contextual information that allows them to infer um, a great deal of information from, from um, on their own. And a lot of times, it's the easiest labels to the easiest labels to provide are also the easiest uh, for people to infer. And so, how do we start answering questions that people want to know, uh, and which are much more contextual and probably much harder? And then finally, just hang tight here. Right? It did see his answer. The, the temperature earlier. Really. Okay, a web worker said that 75 is on the left and 71 is on the right. They're not sure what the current temperature is. I can tell you that 71 is what I have it set at. <laughs> What's interesting here, they, he got an answer back from the crowd, but they also weren't able to actually answer his question either. Um, but they were able to appropriately convey their inability to do so and provide enough information that then allowed Justin to figure out the answer on his own. Um, and so, uh, you know, errors are really important uh, and not created equally, right? And so oftentimes, I think in AI, we think a lot about accuracy rates, but I think what we need to think about are what kind of errors we're producing, which ones are recoverable, especially in an intelligent system, um, and how, given that the AI will, will sometimes be uh, incorrect, how do we still incorporate it into a useful application? Um, so one, one uh, result I really like along these lines is from uh, Microsoft Research, uh, Mary Morse's group at CHI this year, in which they explored how blind users interpreted correct and incorrect captions that were applied to social media images. And so even when the captioning was wrong, they'd often invent stories for why the captioning might be right. So why, for instance, why would a man doing a trick on a skateboard be a good description for uh, a Hillary Clinton campaign uh, page? Um, they said things like, well, maybe she's trying to appear like you know, young and hip. Um, Something like that. Uh, <laughs> um, and so we need to think about you know, how we can convey our confidence um, in uh, the results that we get back from AI systems, and how do we convey those confidences to users so that they know how much to trust the system, when to trust the system, et cetera. Uh, all right, and so just to recap, um, you know, I think it's really important that we uh, think about how we can amplify users by, understand, by providing AI support. Um, how we can understand the user's needs so we can make sure that we're solving the real problems. Um, how we can embrace and understand errors that the AI systems will make and that will be propagated onto the users. Um, and how we can measure confidence and express it well. And so with that, I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panelists and our plenary speaker. Um, again, we have time for questions. And just make sure you go to the mic because uh, we have a pretty good online audience as well. This is a wonderful panel. Thank you all so much. Just wonderful. I wanted to ask uh, Jeffrey, um, why for blind, this is like a, a general question, for blind people, why it's not possible to make some braille over a screen? So why do we actually need to still go to the somebody help them sing instead of maybe transferring you know, the screen to something that they can touch? Mm -hmm. um, should I? Yeah, sorry. Steal some oh. Steal some. Yeah, so uh, a great question. Um, so in some instances, that's possible. So for instance, text. Some people would prefer to read text in Braille. In general, it's very difficult to recover kind of the rich visual information using uh, a, tactile, a tactile form instead. Um, so, for instance, um, you know, I think oftentimes people would think, well, maybe I could just take a photograph and just make it into a, like an embossed printing. Um, but doing that, it sh turns out, is, is uh, impossible to uh, tell what's in the photograph at any sort of detail. Thank you. Hi, Tanya Berger -Wolf. Great, t uh, Great talks, great research throughout. Um, but a lot of it, it seems to me, is very culturally specific to, to US, for example, and to a very particular. So how, does, how much of it, whether it's Google Glass or the, the, the older technology that helps people with disabilities, how much of it transfers across cultures outside of the US, outside of the Western cultures, for example, and so on? Well, I'll say that when we started looking at Google Glass overseas, uh, it was a really big problem 
right? We, you know, not only is there accents for all sorts of different languages, but there's a lot of cultural differences. And you know, either do that by hand, or you use the same sort of machine learning you did in the first place um, to help deal with the problem. And fortunately, you have a, at least a place to begin. So you know, it's one of these things where you can actually you know, leverage both human and machine ability to adapt to the, the cultural differences. Brandon, do you want to speak to sure. physical rehabilitation? Yeah, so I'd say there's definitely um, a difference in the types of devices that we use for within physical rehabilitation across different cultures. Not even so much a cultural different, but difference, but like an infrastructure difference. So for example, powered wheelchairs um, just don't work in certain environments, especially if you can't charge the battery, but then, and so then you might be looking at actually adapting a manual wheelchair to be very robust over different terrains, things like that. So I would say, um, if you are in a situation where you're using powered devices already, then our ability to add on autonomy is um, getting cheaper and cheaper. It's still not cheap enough, but it will be cheaper and cheaper. Um, how you actually interface with the person, that is something that we think even within our culture is person specific. So I wouldn't expect anything different there and the way in which it becomes person specific might be different. I'm particularly so interested to hear from Jeffrey. Um, sure. Uh, so we, we, uh, we released BizWiz on the uh, App Store, and so uh, it was available across the world. Um, we got most of our questions um, from English speakers, mostly because the app was in English and the uh, workers may have spoken other languages, but they were signed on to a Mechanical Turk, which is primarily English site as well. Um, I think there were some cultural differences, some anecdotal, um, just in terms of what people chose to ask. Um, and maybe there was probably, I think the hardest part about this is understanding who didn't say use a service like uh, VizWiz because maybe they didn't feel comfortable sending the photograph off to um, somebody on the web or other things like that. And I bet there's a lot of really interesting differences there that I don't know a lot about, but I suspect they're there. Thank you. Um, Mark Hill, Wisconsin and CCC. Um, so there's a lot of concern about AI and jobs, and, but what you guys have shown is that uh, computer systems and AI working in concert with humans can create great synergies. So how do we amplify that to create many jobs in the future that involve uh, human uh, computer symbiosis? I think Jeff's... Uh, Easy question. <laughs> I mean, I think Jeff's approach, you know, really shows that the fact that what's going to happen, at least in the near term, is going to create a whole lot more jobs um, uh, uh, as the stuff ramps up. And then what we always see with this technology is that the jobs change and get more interesting. Um, the uh, 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 as we make as we make systems that amplify human potential, we always find new things, and and the jobs just kind of multiply. Um, we've seen that, I think, with with every revolution that we've, in every evolution we've had it so far, um, we've seen that happen. I think we'll uh, see it happen again. I mean, I think, um, you know, just to that point, you know, every tech company now has a huge force of uh, crowd labor that they're using to train all of these fancy new AI systems. Um, and so that's one sort of, of, of work. But I think what we want to think about is, you know, how do you make that sort of work um, have the qualities that we might want in, uh, people's careers, right? So what does it mean to be a crowd worker and be kind of proud as, of that as a career? Um, and there's a lot of challenges. And I think what we have started to do and what I think is really interesting is how can we use the AI technology that we have to support kind of people that are working in this kind of new type of economy, whether that's crowd workers in a company or maybe that's more like you know the gig economy. So there's much more flexible work arrangements that people are finding, um, things like, uh, the, well, the problems with that can be, it can be difficult to find work, it can be difficult to have kind of long-standing uh, worker relations, relations, right, so that you can actually count on having employment. Um, and so what people have started to do is, you know, build AI systems that find you the work. So you take out the unpaid work of finding work, you build the AI system to do that. Um, what people are doing is starting to think about, well, how can you amplify the skills that uh, workers bring to the task so they can get more done? and maybe that allows them to earn a higher wage. Uh, maybe they're using AI to start training you, as you might on a traditional job, um, to kind of graduate to kind of higher skill work. And so we need these systems to support the workers who are kind of entering this new kind of workforce, 
uh, so that they can better themselves, so that this is not just a temporary, let's train the AI so that it can all put us out of work, but rather let's uh, work with the AI so that while we're training the AI, we can become better and we can graduate to new, higher skill jobs. I also think about this uh, quite a bit in the context of robotics specifically and what we should maybe be teaching within like high school or elementary school education to train people to be partners to robots. So this is not the case that it's going to be that everyone can program a robot or everyone can build a robot, but that everyone can use a robot and interface with a robot, which we've certainly seen happen with computers. And I, I, I firmly believe that is not going to be the case, that we just have robots completely taking over a huge swath of jobs because they just aren't going to be able to. There's still going to be a human in the loop. And getting that human and robot to actually integrate well together and training people to be able to do that is going to be important. When we see graduate students who know how to run these systems so well, it's not just because they programmed them and built them. It's because they've spent hundreds of hours with them and they know how to anticipate how robots behave and how they perceive the world and how they're going to interact or react to things. And those are skills we can be teaching that are not a part of a skilled labor force. I think similarly what we're seeing now is that computing and interacting with computers is a fundamental skill like reading and writing is and we should be teaching that at the lowest levels of education on up through so people so we raise uh, people who are ready for these jobs i was remember i was doing my phd in 1991 when a report came out from the nsf saying there's too many phd's in computer science right and i you know we're not going to be able to support this number of phd's in computer science and i was like too bad i'm doing this anyways um, and you know, by the time I got done with my PhD, it's like this is a crisis. We don't have enough PhDs in computer science. And you know, right now in, in computing, just in general, across the board, there's so much work needs to be done. People are so desperate for this for for these jobs. I was just talking to a, a cab driver, um, and he said, "Oh, I need. I don't even need a certification, and I can get a nine thousand dollar a year job. Um, all I got to do is have my Oracle uh, uh, certificate person say that I attended class." <laughs> It's just amazing, um, the desperation right now for, for these types of workers. Yeah, you were before me. I snuck over to this mic because I don't look dumb, do I? Okay, um, I recently attended a conference on brain-machine interfaces and they talked about um, using a brain interface. Um, currently they're using, oh, I'm Cherry Tom from IEEE, by the way. Um, they're using EEG, which is a not a very good interface for control. Um, you talked about wearables and you talked about intent to action. So how are you working toward that brain machine interface that you can get the intent of the user to do the action using wearables perhaps? Yeah, so, well, robotics, the H HRI stuff would be interesting, but first of all, do anything except the brain computer interface first, <laughs> right? <laughs> brain computer interfaces are slow and they are, have a lot of bugs in them currently. Um, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just brain interfaces are painful. Um, that being said, um, uh, we're starting to see for the first time stuff that actually kind of makes sense. One of the things my lab is working on with Melody Jackson is making earbuds that you can get brain signals from just a normal looking pair of earbuds. Um, you can do things where you can attend to different types of flashing icons and which one everyone you attend to, not which one you look at, triggers. And so you can use this for selecting things and controlling a robot or controlling a communication device. Um, the work that I've been doing that I was kind of most exciting about is that you can, actually use, you can actually think in sign language and pick up phrases of sign language off the motor cortex. Um, and uh, uh, this is with an fMRI. We're hoping to do this with uh, functional near infrared as well uh, at some point. So, you know, while I am, I would say if you have any motor control whatsoever, use that first before you use EEG or, F or fMRI. <laughs> but if you need to do a brain computer interface, it's getting interesting. <laughs> I will say it's finally getting interesting. Sure. So, um, when I speak with clinicians about this, their estimate is that. Uh, any kind of brain-computer interface being widely deployed in the population and adopted is at least 10 to 15 years out. Um, you're right that EEG is a, is a really challenging interface because it has a poor signal-to-noise ratio and it's hard to imagine how that ever wouldn't be the case. So most people, when they think of this actually being a viable, deployable technology, they're talking about cortical implants 
or there's also a sort of like semi, there's sort of an um, in-between where it's actually a, an electrode that goes under the surface of the skull, so you get by the signal to noise ratio because you're under the scalp muscles, but you're not actually touching the brain. And um, there are subsets of the population where this is going to be their only option, and for them it's going to be revolutionary. And if we get it to the point where it's a commercial consumer product, um, then it can augment and supplement all of these other technologies that we're using that aren't using um, brain-computer interfaces as well, which will be great. But I'm, the jury is definitely out on whether or not everyone would adopt this technology. There are certainly be, uh, even if it gets cheap enough and it's covered by insurance, not everyone is going to want a bullet jolt in their head to get it. So. Something I want to try, by the way. We should talk <laughs> about this. I want to take fiber optic. I'm starting to get, you know, losing the hair up here. Uh -huh. So I want to take fiber optic and do the hair club for men thing, put mm -hmm. the plugs in and then color like hair and see if I can right. actually get F near off of that. There you go. So, yeah. <laughs> You've heard it here first. <laughs> if I could jump in with a slightly more development-oriented near-term perspective, I don't have an electrical interface to any of you. Right. Maybe this is partially electrical, but you're, you're hearing me talk. And I think the advances that we've made in, in speech, both synthesis and recognition, and in textual analysis in terms of translation systems, which are text to text, have been, have been huge. And so in many ways, the, you, we already have telepathy. It's called speech, right? Thoughts in my head, make it into your head in possibly garbled form. Why don't we bootstrap that to make our immediate generation of, of literate devices <coughs> and wait for these guys to solve the electrical interface problems? <laughs> I just, I want to thank, first of all, thanks for a great panel. Um, Donna Sprout, Metz University of Southern California. Um, I wanted to sh give a shout out to Sushi's work. And I think that it's something that keeps, that keeps not quite being mentioned in all of these discussions. And that is that I remembered the term and now of course I've been standing here for 10 minutes and I've forgotten it, but it's, sh it was shared computing or what was the term, Sushi? Joint reasoning. Joint reasoning. Human machine reasoning. Yeah, because that, and then to, to build on Brenna's great stuff, saying, you know, not everybody's going to adopt this, that, or the other. Well, not everybody's going to adopt ever, anything. Everybody, you know, when I talk about my iPhone and somebody says, well, everybody uses an iPhone, why do we have to tailor? And I said, yeah, but my iPhone looks like my bedroom slippers because it is tailored to me. So when we're working together with people and also together across disciplines, there has to be this shared, what did you call it? Shared conceptual model and shared, joint human shared, machine reasoning. Joint human machine reasoning. And how do we build that into all of these? And how do we work across these platforms? So Cliff, I think you're right. Our first form of telepathy is speech. But how do we, every, in every different isolated lab across the country, everybody's reinventing that wheel. And they're not working with people like me, behaviorists, who can help them, who can help them invent an easier, more useful wheel that other people will understand. So when you're talking about how do people, I'm just jumping around, but thoughts, how do people in different countries experience or in different cultures experience these technologies? Well, that's also Suchi's idea on its side. How are we sharing those decisions with them? How are we using what behavioral science has known for a really long time? And that's, for instance, that the people who are answer, or using crowdsourced questionnaires in India have the tendency to use the out ends of the scale, whereas the people using, who, who are shared computing in Holland will say three <laughs> on a scale of one to five for about everything, right? Any Dutch people here besides me? So, you know, how are we taking all these knowledges that we have and all the stuff that we can only do shared and putting that together and maybe try it to stop, to thinking, about, stop thinking about what everybody's going to adopt and making a thing that we can all use, like an iPhone. I don't know. Okay. Speak to that. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> any, Suji, any, uh, anyone else want to jump in? Thanks, Donna. So, I think... Um, uh, just to touch on both Donna's points and then a few things that came up before, um, this field is just really hard from all the panelists we heard today. Like the challenges, it's not something that is so well scoped and well defined and you have a clear objective and like in machine learning, once we have a clear objective, you know how to optimize for it and we're happy. But here, you know, the user's preferences change. 
over time, users across users, they have different preferences. You're trying to enable them. As they get more educated, they're gonna use things differently. And um, how do we build these shared conceptual models? How do we get them to become effective with computers? But more so, we always focus on you know, the field that produces these models itself. Like, I'm a machine learning researcher, and as we produce these models, for me, what I'm starting to realize is maybe we're just training all our models around the wrong objective. We need to understand more clearly what the humans actually want. How do we actually make them more effective? And then we go back and start to think, reimagine what that training procedure looks like for the right kind of models. So I feel like we're like barely at the start of like what will be a very exciting area of like enabling uh, joint human machine reasoning. Ben Schneiderman, University of Maryland. Thank you for a wonderful and inspiring panel and tied together by the theme of amplifying human abilities. And Brenna and Jeffrey focused on raising the abilities of those with disabilities. Brenna using the very wonderful phrase of ensuring human control. And Sushi seeking to raise the level of expert performance well above that. These seem like the directions I want to hear, and it's yet so fresh and appealing that it comes together in this panel. So my question is really to Beth Minat, as a meta question, <laughs> of how to take that energy and that vision and make that the dominant one, because now it's still a struggle to assert these messages. And making it the dominant one, I think, will dramatically accelerate the progress of technology in the service of human needs and for what the purpose of this conference is about addressing national uh, priorities and societal needs. So how do we change the journalists who are so entranced to write about the AI notions? And how do we, how do we reach the computer scientists and those who are working on the new technologies to appreciate, emphasize, and, and push forward these ambitious and bold and virtuous goals? Never go to Ben when he has a question. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, playing the role of moderator, I'm going to reframe this as a question for the panel. Um, but I think what has been interesting in the field of AI have been the grand challenges that we have put out to the field. And those of you who are on Twitter know that as a moderator, I was still tweeting uh, Jeff's grand challenge about uh, AI to help uh, people who are blind to see. Right? That should be a grand challenge for our field. But we've had grand challenges aplenty, for example, in speech recognition, decades of that. Here are the data sets. Here's to do this automation, 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 right? How do we train this? What would be the grand challenges that we should imagine around human computer symbiosis? Um, and I will keep pattering while you think about answering that question. But um, because I'm married to an early technology adopter person, um, an Alexa <laughs> appeared in my home the other day. Um, and so it's been fun because my husband likes it because he likes playing with technology and the rest of us are, I'm sorry, but eh. Um, and we'll, so Alexa started the morning by, by uh, giving us a joke. And so we, we repeated the joke back to Alexa and Alexa essentially said, I'm sorry, I can't understand that. Right. I was like, all we did was repeat back what Alexa had said 10 seconds earlier. And so is there a grand challenge of conceptual models around um, telling jokes, stand-up comedy? Imagine what you have to do, Ben doesn't like it, but you have to establish a frame of reference. You have to be able to establish kind of the characters or the things that you were saying, and then humor, which is highly cultural, uh, with, a nod to, with a nod to Donna. Um, but I think there are these, these, these beautiful tight tasks that we do as human beings, whether we're telling jokes or telling stories or we're navigating the physical environment or where we're like, I'm, ju I'm juggling with something, how do I hand that off? Um, that we just haven't put in front of our community as a way of saying how do, com how do machines and people work together? And I think Howard, Sarah, uh, the lovely lady from uh, DARPA, um, that should be challenges that our research community is, is, is funded to face um, and allows us to change this conversation around so much that has been around automation and change the conversation back to amplification because that's where Vandevar Bush and that's where Licklider started us in 1945 and we've lost that path. 
Beth, you've been a, a leader in promoting personal health care delivery and other, and those are the grand challenges, the health care delivery, energy sustainability, environmental preservation, cybersecurity, community safety. We have these real challenges. And this way of thinking, I think, is the way forward. So I'm looking to you and the CCC and CRA to take the message of this panel and make it the dominant message of our field. Thank you. Thank you. Finn now became a panelist. Um, does anybody want to jump in? Or, but we have lots of great folks. I just wanted to say that okay. Jeffrey Hinton thinks that the machines will understand humor before Americans do. <laughs> <laughs> when I was, um, they brought me on to the XAI X Prize. I say, what's the grand challenge there? And one of the things I said is cooking an omelet. But you know, the uh, why, being more serious, I said there's going to be a huge healthcare crisis crisis for at home care for the elderly. And having, I think, a great grand challenge is just having a first person perception system that really un just not even does the robots, but even just understands what you do for home health care. Um, uh, uh, my father right now is bed bound, and ha knowing that. You know the the procedures being followed correctly for catheters and for for bed washing and bed sore uh, uh, maintenance, all that sort of stuff. That is, I think, I think we can do that. I think we can do that in five years, and it would be a tremendous boon, not just for AI, but for a tr you know millions of people um, who are are facing this healthcare crisis. I, w I want to propose a sort of meta grand challenge, which is. I think a lot of times when we have these grand challenges, we have one very specific application. And what happens then, it sort of gets people to imagine themselves around this very concrete application, like cooking an omelet. And then they start introducing engineering paradigms around that very specific task, which scopes their thinking. So what if we had a meta challenge, which is, uh, can you create an example of a system where humans and machines are more effective together than the human itself or the machine itself. And so in other words, let people come up with their own emergent examples and demonstrate creative ways in which uh, this can be done. And then the exciting aspect of it is we will see very different paradigms of the two interacting. But then also have a challenge, but you go further and see how they generalize across other people's domains. Yeah, right? One of the things that I've been challenging, challenging my students at is, you know, everybody keeps uh, making recognition systems for walking or running or tennis right. strokes. What if we can make one algorithm that will rule them all, one algorithm that can actually adapt itself for these different situ situations? I think, you know, the, my, my thing is actually you know, f feasible. We have some examples of that. I think your, your proposal is better um, in that, you know, we can actually see a diverse sort of applications come out and then we can see, the see how well the algorithms generalize across right. these things, have people mix them up and, and try each other's stuff on it. Right. I like that a lot. I, I think one more issue here is that the fact, at least as uh, someone who designs algorithms, um, I, my main concern is that we're not, I'm not even sure we have a framework, right? In other words, right now we think of like, you know, we have some supervised learning objective and we basically train it on some data. And I, I think that sort of classical way of thinking that we approach, uh, uh, you know, we and we learn as you know, using supervised data, we learn some algorithm and that algorithm does something. I, I actually think that we need to sort of open up our way of thinking of even trying to construct what are the, you know, what are the metrics for even understanding performance? What are yeah. the metrics for optimizing around this performance? There is, like, there is no metric for, that. There is no metric for unsupervised right. learning right now, really, right? Right. How, how do we, you know, if you, if you apply, I'm doing dolphin vocalizations right now with, with unsupervised learning. I, can't, I don't have any good metrics for it, right? Um, the only good metrics is when you actually solve the problem and you can do normal recognition rates, but what do you do for discovery rate? We don't even have that in the literature, yet, at least not to my knowledge, in a reasonable right. form. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think the field is like wide open and it's very exciting. I think we can define it, right? So, so one reason I started in crowdsourcing was because I was frustrated by basically not having the data to train the systems to make the thing to see if it's even worth making the thing, right? And so if you can use crowdsourcing, it's just one example, there's probably others, to power the applications to see if people use them, how they use them, whether they adopt it, if it's actually something they want, um, that might be one way. And then creating data, it's like one of the hardest things, but one of the probably the most important 
for driving you know, important work in machine learning is creating data sets for the problems you want solved. And that's one way to do it is with crowdsourcing. And surprisingly hard, when we're starting Glass, I was insisting that our, our researchers do Wizard of Oz experiments, just like you're, you're talking about, to learn what problems they're really trying to solve first. And once you hit upon it, then you actually have the data to do a first pass at it. Yeah. And that allows you to iterate rapidly. And you know, I think that more machine learning researchers really need to have the sort of approach that you've been doing yeah. uh, with VizWiz and the other programs to actually you know, make rapid progress and actually know what problem they're trying to solve. Right. I'm going to take moderator's privilege, although I love the idea of a Harry Potter, like who can make the best wizard uh, competition. This gentleman's been standing for ages, so let's get to him uh, with a few more questions. Uh, Eric Palmer, Lehigh University. Thanks again for fabulous and fantastic panel. My question actually picks up kind of where that conversation left off. So it's potentially well timed and it actually has to do with something that Jeff raised that's still on the slides. This point that all errors are not equal, yes. yeah. right? Yes. But the large majority of our machine learning metrics say, is this a false positive? or is it a false negative, right? So we have like these two things that you could look at. I'd love to hear ideas about other kinds of approaches. If we, if we take for granted that not all errors are equal, what kinds of errors are there? And then how do we use that in diversity to inform different kinds of metrics? So if you have the misfortune of following me on Twitter, you'll hear me rant about these things a lot. But um, we've worked in the domain of speech recognition, and, and especially um, as applied to captioning for deaf and hard of hearing people. Um, and that's a really great example of where all errors are not equal, uh, where you know, we can say that we've reached new human parity on some data sets, but when you actually try to deploy it in an application, have people use it, you can understand you know, that people often make mistakes like someone versus somebody. It's completely understandable. A machine might be someone versus potato. And if you're a student that's in a classroom who's trying to follow along, it's, it's very difficult. And so this is really hard to scale, but you know, at some level, I mean, it's the application. Whatever the end application that you're trying to work toward, that's the real metric of success. But we need more ways to scale that, right? Because not every machine learning, every speech recognition researcher is going to be able to you know, have a user study at every iteration of their algorithm. I guess I would just jump in with a comment that I believe that um, this idea of not all errors being equal is actually um, largely the reason why voice recognitions were to control powered wheelchairs were abandoned in the 80s and 90s. There were commercial products and they were trained on data sets of the human's voice and they did a good job and then in emergency situations people use a different tone of voice and they shout stop and it wouldn't get it and that is a catastrophic error, right? And that's much more important to get that than sometimes miss go forward, right? And so um, Obviously now speech recognition systems are much better and stuff, but that's just one example where I think actually the in inequality of errors actually led to the um, abandonment of the technology. I'll give you a quick example from my research when you're trying to translate from sign language to English or English to sign language. This is meat. This is rude. <laughs> I cannot, I will not actually translate that for you. But all you gotta do is make that mistake once in front of somebody who's deaf and you'll be, you'll be laughing stock for the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific question. Um, here we go. So Kevin Croston, Syracuse University. Um, I wanted to put in a shameless plug and then ask an actual real question. The shameless plug is that uh, I and some colleagues recently received funding from the NSF to run a research coordination network uh, which we are calling Work in the Age of Intelligent Machines. So we want to get all of the researchers in the community who are specifically interested in how AI is going to affect work um, as opposed to the very simplistic notion about unemployment, uh, uh, riffing off of what uh, Mark Hill asked. Um, so that's the uh, shameless plug. And if anyone's interested, it's uh, W-A-I-M, WAIM, dot network. Network, the word network. Uh, the real question is that um, while the examples have been very um, inspiring, I noticed that it's uh, mostly very micro level tasks that people have been addressing. The one exception maybe being the uh, doctor in uh, Thad's first video, where you could really see the potential of the system for changing the way somebody's job looked by taking out some of the less attractive parts and giving more time to focus on the uh, more uh, rewarding parts. 
And so I'm wondering uh, whether uh, other uh, members of the panel or perhaps that have additional uh, thoughts about how the t kinds of technologies that you're working on are really going to change the way people's jobs work, not, not by eliminating them, but by actually doing this augmentation at the level of the job as opposed to a single task. Mm -hmm. Suchi, you're certainly changing jobs. Yeah, I actually think that, um, I think it certainly could be the quality of the slides, but <laughs> I think the three areas we spoke about, it will fundamentally change the way they manage these patients. So it's sort of building on uh, Thad's direction where you could imagine you know, um, what Tad was showing was the ability to record automatically, quickly what was being said and change the way they're interacting with the computer. Now imagine very fundamentally, their goal is to provide better care for their patients, right? And for them, what does this mean cognitively? They're constantly, right now, you know, they have a schedule, they go on rounds and they have a, you know, when they look at specific patients and what are they doing and they're doing information seeking. They're going around seeking specific sources of information and, uh, and trying to imagine, you know, how this might all interleave to give a picture of the patient. And this, a lot of this is going to fundamentally change. And for them, it's going to be much more about, you know, collaborating with the machine to try to figure out what do we think is happening to this person and how can I best take care of this patient? So I think the physician's role is going to, physician, and by that I mean the care team's role, is going to be fundamentally reimagined as these technologies come to play. All right, let's, um, these are going to be our last two questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dan Wallach, Rice University. One of the things that I, learned in a prior life of working on some accessibility projects is that a really good accessibility technology has an incredible payoff beyond its target. The canonical example being curb cuts. They were invented for people with wheelchairs and they're used by bicyclists, they're used by delivery people with hand trucks. Incredibly useful. So with that as a, as a setting the scene, how can we engineer accessible technologies mind extension technologies, gadgets, whatever, in a way that help accessibility needs, but will have broader impact, which then might help with adoption. I'll give you an example from Glass. Um, I do a lot of work with people with movement impairments, um, uh, and it didn't occur to me uh, the fact that we were making a really good device for them. Um, so with Glass, you can actually tilt your head up, you have it on, turn on the display, and then start issuing verbal commands. Um, this means that you can do things like send SMS and receive SMSs quickly. You get one coming in, it, it, it taps your head, you turn your head up and you, you, you see the SMS. And it turns out for people with movement impairments, it takes them from being at the periphery of their social networks, being at the center of their social networks because they can react faster than anybody else with their normal <laughs> phones. Um, and this kind of stunned me when I saw this. And it occurred to me if I've been paying attention to that group in the first place, I would have been helping all these people who are trying to SMS while walking or while you know, uh, uh, shopping or working or, or interacting with the world, I, I would have made a much better system. Right? And so one of the things I always look at is, is whenever you look at somebody who has some disability, look at this, the situation impairments that causes that same disability with the majority of the population. When you walk, you don't have the same visual acuity, you don't have the same auditory acuity, you don't have the same tactile acuity. Um, uh, uh, all these things affect everybody, and you can almost find, always find an analog between folks in uh, accessible technology and their needs and the mass population. And you just, you can map it directly. Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll just add on um, one of the fascinating things, the reason why I work so much in accessibility is because I think we get to see useful applications of this really fancy technology earlier. And so it's not quite what you said of, of starting out with this intent of making it mainstream, but more let's work out the kinks in a way that actually is beneficial to somebody. Um, and, and our history shows that it is almost always eventually adopted, um, something around the technologies um, almost always adopted mainstream. We'll take our last question. Last question. So Bill Regley from DARPA. I've had the honor of serving there the last three years. I think this is a great panel. 
Uh, we've made huge investments in this area over the last three or four years. In fact, probably uh, on the order of 10 to 20 programs exist that are focusing on human-machine symbiosis of some sort, whether it be putting chips in your brain, uh, yeah, we, we have one that does that, to man-machine technologies. And one of the vectors that I'm not sure I'm hearing addressed, which may be an opportunity for the community, is how do we go further up the cognitive ladder? Because a lot of the mere interaction technologies are just the tip of the iceberg. We're looking at problems in areas of synthetic biology and chemistry where we want to essentially computer augment chemists. We're looking at problems of machine reading to augment clinical people in the medical area. And the challenge becomes that as you build the new interaction technology, you actually transform the problem that the clinician then solves. So you're doing this simultaneous, you know, it's not just providing a new widget on the user interface and then testing it. It's actually you're totally transforming the human role in the problem, given what the computer can now do. And I feel as if we need a new science of how to do this, because it essentially, you know, just having a good paper at CHI doesn't solve the problem. Having a good paper at AAAI doesn't solve the problem. Uh, we have a program in uh, com uh, computer-aided design, and literally the mechanical design community still draws with dimensions. So what's design look like in an environment where the computer can synthesize shapes for me automatically? Yeah. So how do we get up the cognitive ladder is, is the question as a grand challenge question. So where, how would we do that? Because we're investing in it, I'm, I'm saying. You know, there's, yep. there's money to be had if you get into the domains, yep. but, but how do you do it as a community? Uh, you know my perspective on that, which is go for the first person perspective, have the computer understand what it is to live in the human world, and then you can talk at a higher level of abstra abstraction. We just don't have the data sets yet to do that. I guess that leads to my perspective, which is a lot of, I think, what you, what you want is unknown, but we might be able to kind of prototype it before we can do it automatically with the crowd, and that may give us the data that then, then allows us to do it automatically. Hmm. A crowd of really smart chemist. Mm -hmm. Might be. Yep. Right Go to Docker. Yeah, and I, I agree that this is a fantastic thing to be thinking about, and it's hard for me, at least in my domain, to imagine how you would get at that information without doing extensive user studies out in the real world, actually in dynamic environments, um, with all of the challenges that come with that. I think I come at this from a slightly different perspective, but in the machine learning infrastructure side of things, learn to learn is a huge thing for us, and we've gotten neural networks to train other neural networks to say, here's the best way to build a visual recognizer and automatically search the space. And the ambitions go to all the tasks that we program, like so learn to build optimized code and learn to design new machines eventually. So I think that is going up the cognitive stack. I think that there's a bunch of difficult problems with how do you represent the problem as a machine learning problem? And that, maybe that's the de decryption we're doing now. It's, it's as with many of these techniques it's, techniques, it's kind of amazing that it's working and we, some of the time don't actually understand why it's working to do learn to learn, but it is paying off in pushing the Pareto frontier of possible solutions in ways that we've not seen before. I think there's something really fundamentally uh, interesting and hard that Bill says that like sort of stuck out to me, which is as we're building, you know, often in our studies, the way we do this is, you know, we build a system and right now you give it to the human and you see how they react to it and then you write a paper on it. And the challenge is you're saying, which I think is completely true, is the fact that the humans are gonna have to learn how to work with it. So you're simultaneously you know, kind of causing a culture change. And that doesn't fit very nicely into this paper paradigm because you're basically sort of you know, getting them to change. Over time, you're recording their perception. So what might have been initially considered a failed technology may not be a failed technology at all. It's just a matter of getting them there and your procedure for getting them there was perhaps not in place the first time around, or that they needed to have stuck with it for like X amount of time to get there. So I think, really, I think, um, I, I, I think like as a community, I mean, just even the drudgery of day to day, like where do these things get published? Like, you know, there's so much cool work we could do, like for instance, even in these kinds of systems we're building, you know, deploying, seeing humans use it, understanding how to communicate, these are all real areas where we can completely make progress, but I think as a community we should figure out, you know, how do we support, just beyond, even beyond the funding. I think yeah. funding alone is not the answer, but like, as a, you know, what is the way in which we can create a community where like, it becomes easy to share these ideas, publish these ideas, communicate across disciplines more easily, 
and I think there will be new areas that will, new interaction points that need to come up that like currently our community doesn't support to build this type of work. No, this is terrific and using this as a way to, to wrap, you know, if we take Bill's challenge to the panel and then Ben's challenge to the panel of these grand challenges, I almost need, you know, a team of biochemists and then, you know, Suchi's algorithms with, uh, with Google horsepower behind it, and then work on the interaction and the symbiosis, but they both have to be learning and evolving together, right? So it's not keeping the human static and wrapping the new technology around it. So it's getting to some of what Brenna was saying as well, which is you're trying to find that, that level of helpful enough and not getting in the way. And, and pulling these pieces together. So I think we've had a fantastic discussion. So thank you to the speakers and thank you to a very engaged audience as well.